All right, everybody, uh, welcome. I hope you're having a good time and everyone's staying safe out there. Uh, I wanted to take the opportunity to take this uh, video and explain a little bit about what's going on with coronavirus and why it's so crazy. And most importantly, I wanted to talk about why coronavirus seems to have gotten us so crazy and had so many good doctors out there stumped. So this is gonna get into a little bit of the biology and the specifics of coronavirus. If you just wanna know some of the symptoms and some of the ideas and ways to protect yourself, I would suggest going to a different video. This is getting into a little bit more of what is going on with coronavirus, what we're seeing as physicians, and how we're dealing with it. First, we have to say is, what is coronavirus and what's happening with it? Well, coronavirus is any kind of virus that has a specific ring or a series of proteins around it, which allow it to essentially use a lock and key mechanism to enter the body. Now, all viruses are known to have essentially that kind of lock and key mechanism, right? By its definition, what a virus does is it tries to enter the host cell in order to hijack the machinery of that cell in order to use it to replicate itself like it was a cell or a mini cell, we'll say, so that it can make more baby viruses. Those viruses either break out or get destroyed. And then those viruses go off and do their little virus baby thing. So with coronavirus, it is a single-stranded RNA virus, which means it has a little bit of an RNA uh, molecule on the inside, similar to our DNA, which allows it to get into the cell and replicate. It also is enveloped, right? And it has a fatty envelope that's around the outside, which helps protect it, keeps it alive, and it also allows it to help enter our cells, right? So we know this about viruses. There's lots of coronaviruses that are out there. They tend to cause the common cold and things that we're pretty used to. What's different about this one? Understand that all this data is still a little bit new and we're figuring it out, but what's come out so far is pretty interesting. First off, what we found is, and especially based on models based on uh, SARS, which is a most similar virus, we found that this particular virus had an affinity for something called the ACE2 receptor in the body. Now, the ACE2 receptor uh, in itself, as far as we understand it, is involved with regulating blood pressure and specifically regulating blood pressure and how much pressure goes on in different organs. This ACE2 receptor also has other minor functions that we don't completely understand, but we know where it is, right? So you do find a significant amount of those ACE2 receptors in the back of your nose. You find them at the bottom of your lungs in specific cells in the bottom of your lungs. You find them on the endothelium. Now the endothelium is the inner layer of the blood vessels that surround the heart. So the vessels that are supplying the heart, the oxygen that it needs to function, the inside of those blood vessels can be susceptible uh, to the virus because they have the ACE2. We also know that it's on the kidneys and we know that it's on the liver, right? So these are all potential targets. Okay, so we know this attacks us and it makes sense, right? So we in medicine have dealt with pneumonias and viral pneumonias for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? That we understand them. So what was happening is we're saying, okay, so we have this ACE2 receptor. We know that the virus needs to attach to that ACE2 receptor in order to invade the cells and cause infection. So it makes sense that it's getting down into those lungs, causing that kind of damage that we've seen before, as well as damage to the heart, the kidneys, and the liver. And then in extreme cases, which can happen with any infection, is it can disseminate throughout the body, cause what's called sepsis, and then essentially lead to an overwhelming reaction by the body and ultimately death. Now, initially, this fell into a disease category that we were calling ARDS, or Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Now, this is not a specific pathogen that causes this. This is a, um, a series of events that occur in response to a specific injury or insult to the lungs, right? So what happens in Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome is basically you get a pathogen or something in the bottom of the lungs that activates the immune response, but kind of overactivates this. It, it activates what we call, or what's kind of in lay terms known as the cytokine storm. So you have a specific cytokine called IL-6, which is responsible for all of that immune response that you have, right? So when you get a fever, when you get the flu in you and you feel terrible, it's that IL-6, it's that cytokine that causes it. Well, that cytokine is also responsible for mobilizing the defensive white blood cells and the, the myriad of different cells that are responsible for keeping you safe and getting rid of uh, outside infections. That IL-6 and that cytokine storm would activate that immune response in the lungs. Now that's good and bad, right? Because some response is decent in that it can help 
uh, get rid of this pathogen, to fight off the virus, fight off the bacteria, and then you get better. Well, if that goes a little bit overboard, now you have, in my analogy, is you essentially have um, F-16s flying over with napalm, trying to blow up the whole area, and now things that are not supposed to be getting blown up are getting blown up, and those things are your lungs. All right. So in acute respiratory distress syndrome, you can think of it as overactivation of your immune response. And that goes throughout your entire body. Your whole body is getting messed up from it. But in particular, we see what happens is your lungs are starting to get damaged and your body goes, oh wait, we need to try and repair it. So first it fills up with fluid and then your body starts to lay down scar tissue. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but if you've ever had a cut or anything like that, scar tissue is not quite the same as the original skin. It's good, it's robust, but it doesn't necessarily allow for that, the movement that you need, okay? So let's talk about this for a second. I think it's kind of interesting. So now let's talk about some of the normal anatomy that you need to understand before you can understand this virus and how it works, okay? So whenever I take a breath in, now you have to watch me take a breath. I hope you enjoyed that. Basically, it goes in through your windpipe, goes down through your bronchi on both sides, bronchioles go down, and then you get down into the alveoli. So alveoli are all these tiny microscopic balloons which help and are basically house the oxygen that are responsible, I'm sorry, that's responsible for then allowing that oxygen to get into your blood. We'll get into that in a second. But essentially, these balloons blow up. <laughs> they have to blow up and expand so they can get thin enough, okay? The other thing, way to understand it, the other way to think about it is at the end of all these alveoli, you have this balloon, but outside of it, is you have the blood running across it, right? So the other way to think about it is a cross section. So here I have my alveoli, the cells on my lungs, right? So up top here is the oxygen that's just kind of hanging out. Here's my air. So then you have a layer of your endothelium. So this is the really thin capillary layer. And then you have your blood, right? So oxygen wants to go through this like a filter into your blood. CO2 wants to go out, right? Now you can imagine the problem is you have really thin layers here, the air, layer, layer, blood. If that layer gets thick, and now it's thick and it's in scar tissue and stuff that's not supposed to be there, that oxygen that's trying to filter through and come in gets blocked and can't go through it, right? That CO2 gets blocked. It's actually more the oxygen. CO2 a little bit, definitely more the oxygen. So that oxygen gets blocked, can't get into your bloodstream, now you're having problems. And what we see, and we see ARDS, it has very clear and obvious signs on x-ray. If you look at an x-ray on someone who has ARDS, what you see is lung full of fluid. The whole x-ray looks thick and gross because that those lungs, those alveoli are getting full of fluid and they're not working properly. So what's nice about that is this is a disease process that we kind of understand. We have protocols in place, we understand how it works. Basically, if you have it, we know that we need to protect your lungs from any additional injury while we allow them to heal most, heal most efficiently so that you can get better as quickly as possible. So here we were, coronavirus, looks like ARDS. We know people are getting sick. Makes sense that that happens with this kind of pneumonia. We're seeing a bit of this, uh, basically seeing the fluid uh, building up in the bottom of the lungs. Problem was, some of the physicians, especially in New York City at Maimonides, and then others in New Orleans, realized something weird was going on, right? So that back to that analogy I gave you with a balloon, right? So you would expect, if I'm blowing up a balloon, it's a regular balloon, nice and easy, Blow it up, blows up nice and easy. But if I put scar down tissue down there, if I make it thick, it's going to take a lot more effort, a lot more energy to try and blow that balloon up. We call that in the medical field compliance, right? So the more compliant your alveoli are, the more likely they are to expand when you breathe in. That pressure, you breathe it in, you open up that pressure, those alveoli expand, great. In ARDS, that doesn't happen. So what was happening in coronavirus? Well, something completely different was happening, is that it looked like ARDS. If you looked at the x-ray, it looked like it. People were kind of not doing well, but the compliance is normal, right? So that tells us that the alveoli are okay. What's going on? Okay, so then what happened is we had researchers out there actually discover that they think the coronavirus is attacking your red blood cells, specifically the heme group on your red blood cells. So now let's talk about this for a second. So in case I have any younger viewers or people who don't know, your red blood cells are the cells that exist in your veins, in your blood, that are responsible from, for carrying the oxygen from your lungs to the organs that need that oxygen, right? 
And the way they do this is they have a very special protein group, a very special protein that kind of hangs out on the outside called the hemoglobin or heme group. And the way it is is there's four proteins kind of mashed together, hold together, and they have an iron molecule in there that helps it attach to the oxygen. So it picks up the oxygen over here, that iron group, carries it down, and drops it off, right? Right. So what one of the researchers found and what they think is going on, one of our running hypotheses at this point, is that the virus is actually attacking that heme group. And what's happening is it's attacking that heme group and knocking off that iron molecule. So now you have this iron molecule, and that iron molecule is very positively charged. It's not supposed to be out there hanging out in your blood. It's supposed to be attached to something. So now it's basically pinging off the blood cells and causing damage as it's going through. Okay, so that's one thing that's happening, seeing that damage occurring higher up in your lungs. Two, when that heme group isn't working, if it's damaging that heme group, now the red blood cells don't have the ability to grab onto that oxygen and take it where it needs to go. What's interesting about that is we're actually seeing that. So what we were seeing with patients coming into the emergency department and coming into the hospital was that they were actually sitting there looking okay, but their oxygen saturation is low, right? So what that means is the oxygen saturation, what we detect is the percentage of red blood cells that have oxygen attached to them, right? So if those heme groups aren't working, the red blood cells are normal, except their heme group's not working, well now that oxygen saturation is gonna go low. But the body can't really detect that. The body's good at detecting how many red blood cells there are and detecting other problems, but it can't see it. So you look and feel okay, but your oxygen levels are low. That's because it's attacking red blood cells. Now what, let's go a step further and what else happens? So now we've sent off that iron group, it's pinging around, causing damage, and doing all sorts of bad things. The heme group that you need to carry the oxygen isn't working, but also your red blood cells damaged, and now it's dying, and they think it's breaking up and blowing up. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem is if that's happening on a large scale, your body doesn't have a good job of distinguishing if that's happening inside or outside, right? So now the body says, blood cells are blowing up. We need to, cause, we need to clot to prevent that from happening, right? So now it activates what's called the coagulation cascade. It's a series of proteins which are activated in order to cause your blood to clot. Now this is happening kind of in your whole system, not in a localized center. So what's happening is we're seeing that happening everywhere, right? So most specifically, we're seeing a bunch of what's called microthrombi, which are microscopic blood clots in the vessels of the lungs, which are blocking up those vessels and preventing the oxygen from getting through. I'm sorry, preventing the red blood cells and the blood from getting through to pick up that oxygen and bring it where it needs to go. So you've got another confounding factor, that's a problem. Also, we're seeing people getting blood clots everywhere. You're more likely to get blood clots in your legs, more likely to get blood clots in your brain, and the big blood clots called pulmonary emboli, which happen in your lungs. Now I have to say, while it might be a little bit morbid of me, it's very interesting. We've never seen a viral process do this. Keep in mind, we could be wrong. We're testing hypotheses, trying to figure out exactly what's causing and why this disease is acting the way that it is, but we are seeing that people are not acting like the acute pneumonias and the typical ones that we see, are getting blood clots in a way that we don't see with, typically with these infections or with other infections. And we're seeing people come in with their oxygen levels being low and we can't explain it. There's a couple other disease processes that we know. If you get a lidocaine toxicity, for example, carbon monoxide poisoning, when that carbon, uh, carbon monoxide replaces the oxygen, and we're not detecting that oxygen in the monitor, that's what we see. But we've never seen a virus do something specifically like this. This is why a lot of those theories for things like chloroquine and those other ones were existing, because maybe it could interfere with the ability for that virus to attach to the red blood cell. Now, talking about treatment and what's working is definitely a conversation for a different time. Uh, we have to talk about back and forth on that, and that's been changing on a daily basis. Um, but hopefully this gives you an understanding and some basic biology, anatomy, and understanding of why coronavirus is so significant, why it's doing things we've never seen before, and why it's interesting, and why we're developing new approaches, new approaches to tackle it and defeat it, hopefully eventually, okay? Again, welcome, I'm Dr. Wiseman. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it was informative. Take care, love you, see you later.